Today, let's discuss what CNC machining is. I'll try and cover the basics, the getting started things, largely framed around the Shapoko ecosystem. The reason I went with CNC was I was looking to make multiples of a given part, as well as a degree of precision and accuracy I just couldn't do by hand. As far as how I chose Carbide 3D in the Shapoko, is the best value for my money. This doesn't mean it's the best in the world, but at the time of purchase, it was the best for my needs. What this video won't be is a how-to guide to find where the print money button is located, or run through a crazy five-axis setup to machine a new hip for your grandparent. There are likely much better videos out there on DIY orthopedic surgery. So what is CNC? CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control. So yes, you will need at least one computer at some point in your journey. What this really means, in three dimensions, you'll be building a coordinate layout of a cut. Think in terms of your old XYZ coordinate system you learned in school. Again, there's some machines out there that have four, five, and even six axes of, move, axes of axes of movement. For anyone watching this video, anything beyond the three axes of movement is out of scope. Think of X is left and right, Y is front to back, and Z is up and down. Let's talk about the software. There are three pieces of software required for any CNC operation. CAD, which stands for Computer Aided Design. Think of this as your drawing program. Then there's CAM, which stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. This is how you tell your machine the cut pattern that you want it to use. And finally, there's the machine control software. This is also known as sending software, milling controller software, G-code streaming software, etc. This effectively streams the coordinates to the CNC machine. I'm not aware of anything that lets you just take a picture of some object and then blow it into your CNC machine. Let's break this down a step further, and for illustrative purposes, let's keep the drawing a simple circle within a square pattern for now. If you're a new to CNC Shapoko user, and you want to focus on 2.5D, 3D being real carving like eagles and skulls and whatnot, then Carbide Create is likely going to be your starting point. There are other software tools out there like Easel or Fusion 360, but Carbide Create is a good launching point. It's both CAD and CAM software rolled into one. So in Carbide Create, let's click this setup gear. We can pretend that we have a 10 by 10 inch square chunk of plywood that's about half inch thick. Plywood is generally undersized, but for now, since we're in the land of make-believe, Let's just set this to half inch thick. A few things to look at. Zero height. We'll zero off the top of the stock. For example, we'll tell the machine where the surface is and zero to the machine from there. Toolpath zero. This is where you'll start your cut from. It's dealer's choice and you'll get a feel for when which option makes the most amount of sense. For us, let's choose the center. Job. And within job, there are several options. So the material, choose the material that best represents what you're cutting. Don't choose hardwood and then toss in some foam core. The cut will take much longer than it needs. It might actually burn up the end mill or melt the material you're trying to cut. If you do the opposite, say trying to cut purple heart at HDPE speeds, you might snap the end mill as it's introduced to your stock faster than it can clear the chips. I believe Carbide Create helps choose rates based on your selection here. You can always override the defaults later. So for now, let's pick hardwood. Machine. Choosing a machine will help set parameters around how big a cutting area you can have in your design. Retract height. This is how high from Z0 the machine should retract the end mill. Keeping this retraction minimally set will speed up the cut. The longer you can keep the end mill down or close to the surface of the stock you wish to cut, the faster you can get through the job. If there's a lot of long retractions, that all will add time to your job. Finally, units. Think in terms of SAE measurements, fractions of an inch. But if you're the UK type or work in metric units, this is where you'd switch things out. So for now, let's draw a five by five inch square with the circle centered in the middle. With this design complete, let's click on tool paths and set up the cut. This is the cam portion of Carbide Create. Now let's talk about cam. We wanna cut the contour of the circle so select the circle and choose a contour cut. We're going to pretend our stock is half inch thick and the resulting object we want is about half inch thick. If this wasn't the case, you could create a set of pocketing operations that would mill down the surface to the thickness you want, or run things through a planer, etc. 
Let's keep it simple for now. So for max depth, let's choose stock bottom. In a perfect world, this should cut all the way through your stock, but not into your spoil board. In reality, this may leave an onion skin behind, or maybe an uneven onion skin. So in this menu, we can see the tool, and in the selection, let's click Edit and click Select Tool. Try to match the material as selected in your original setup again. Carbide is trying to help pick some basic safe parameters for feeds and speeds. Pretending this is your first cut ever, as of this moment in time, your machine was shipped to you with a number 201 end mill. So choose hardwood end mills, number 201, and then OK, and you should see step over, depth per pass, plunge rate, feed rate, RPM. And again, all of these settings are suggestions, and just quickly let's run through it. So step over is how much you should overlap if you were cutting a pocket, for instance. Depth per pass is how much it should proceed lower during each pass of the cut. Plunge rate is how fast it should lower itself into the z-axis. End mills are never designed to cut straight down. That's a, a drill bit operation. Usually with end mills, it ramps down. But plunge rate controls how fast it drops itself into the board. If you go too fast into hardwoods, you'll lose steps in your z-axis at best. At worst, you might actually shatter your end mill. Then we have feed rate. How fast should the machine move through the cut? Here it's measured in IPM or inches per minute. RPM, how fast you should set your router to. There are other tables elsewhere outside of this video I'm not going to get into explaining what number on the dial of your router corresponds to exactly what RPM. You can get fancy and they make RPM or tachometer gauges that you can, I don't think that's really what it's called, but you can point it at the spinning end mill and understand explicitly how fast that thing is spinning. Uh, you don't want to just max out your router and just set it to 11 and just go. You'll, you'll overheat the end mill or you might even burn the material. You don't want to have it run too slowly. Just to reflect here, like all of these are just suggestions. Hardwood doesn't apply to all hardwoods. It's simply a good middle of the road setup. If you're cutting red oak, you may be able to increase the plunge rate, feed rate, and depth per pass. If you're cutting like Ipe or something really, really hard, you're going to want to reduce all those things. You get a feel for this over time based on how much the machine, uh, how the machine is performing, sounds it's making, etc, etc. Ultimately, each end mill has, from the manufacturer, a suggested chip load for optimum performance. There are also various chip load calculators online to help you better dial stuff in, but for now, these suggestions outlined above are likely going to be fine for your first test cuts. Don't jump into trying to dial in Inconel or Titanium for first project, or maybe even on your Shapoko ever. Offset direction. Here you get to choose. Is it the diameter of the hole you want to preserve? Maybe you need a super accurate hole in this location. Or is it the part you're cutting free that you want to preserve? Maybe you're trying to create a wheel. If you cut on the inside of this circle, you'll be preserving the diameter of the hole. If you cut on the outside of this circle, you'll be preserving the donut hole. It's also an option for cutting directly on the line, but for this example, let's just choose inside slash left. And then let's add some tabs. If you don't add some tabs, there's a chance that the part you cut free will fly off or get wedged and jam up the machine such that it loses steps or, again, snaps the end mill or ruins the rest of the part. Maybe it yanks it right out of your clamps. Let's make them about an eighth of an inch thick and about an eighth of an inch high. That should be good enough to hold the part and easy enough to remove later when the time comes. Now click the circle to place the tabs where you want it. For something this small, two tabs is probably fine. If this disc was 10 inches in diameter, then it might peel up on one side or the other and you'd be better served having three or four tabs. Now you can click OK a few times and you'll be back to the toolpath screen. So let's take a peek at the simulation here. Zooming in really close on the edge, each green line is a step down in the cut path. The machine will make this cut in multiple passes. You may find that plywood that you're cutting has a lot of voids or the hardwood is easier going along the grain, whatever the reason. You can choose to engage more of the end mill by increasing the depth of cut. Uh, either way, let's stick with what we have for now. Finally, if you're happy with the toolpath. Let's click save g-code and we'll just name it thingy.nc. What this is going to do is it's going to generate all the coordinates and the speeds at which it should travel to those coordinates and leave them in this file. So let's take a look. Here you can see uh, your familiar x and y patterns, the rate of speed, the speed of the plunge it should take, etc, etc. And as you can see, this is a huge file for just this simple circle with multiple passes and tabs. This is about where we're going to leave off right now. 
Normally you would load this up into motion, you know, secure your stock and perform your cut, select your end mill, etc, etc. But I'm going to leave that for another video. Hope you enjoyed this. Hit like and subscribe. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.